Okay, and we're ready to go. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Travel Geeks with National Geographic Traveller. My name is Farida Zainalova, and I'm one of the contributing editors here. Now, we're all here to talk about all things Northern Territory in Australia. But before I introduce you to our wonderful panel of experts, I want to run through a couple of housekeeping things. Now, for those of you who haven't been to one of our Travel Geeks events before, they're very lively, lighthearted. They last about an hour. And how that hour is going to unfold is for the first 40 to 45 minutes, I'm going to quiz the experts on where to go and what to do and what to eat and everything in between. And then towards the end, you guys at home will have the opportunity to ask them any questions you might have. How do I ask them questions? I hear you all cry. Well, by using the Q&A function, you should see it at the bottom of the screen. As and when you think of something, if we haven't covered it, just ping it over to me and I'll try and get through as many of those questions as I can towards the end. We also have to the right of me, I think, maybe to the left of you, the chat function. And things get pretty lively here. The viewers at home talk amongst themselves about where they're from and whether they've been to the Northern Territory or whether they're planning to go. So feel free to just chat amongst yourselves while I talk to the panelists. But do keep an eye out on the chat window because a little bit later on, my colleague Angelique will be posting a message, a, a link to a short survey. And that will give you guys the chance to win not only some tickets to the to the North, uh, to the National Geographic Traveller Food Festival, but also a pretty fabulous goodie bag from Northern Territory with not only some gin from the very first distillery in Darwin to sunglasses, a phone card holder, and also a travel speaker as well, and a few other uh, really cool goodies in there. So do keep an eye out for that. Um, we do have a couple of members from the National Geographic Traveller um, editorial team on the chat, uh, so they'll be there to uh, answer any questions, as well as um, a representative from Northern Territory. Now, before I uh, bore you all with my, my voice, I'm going to introduce you to our wonderful panel. Now, first up, we have Justin Menaguzi. Justin is an award-winning freelance journalist and photographer from Melbourne, Australia. Now, he actually joins us live from Australia where it's currently an ungodly hour in the morning. So Justin, thank you so much for staying awake and for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Justin has a soft spot for Australia's gloriously wild outback. He's an advocate for sustainable travel and is passionate about traveling in a way to ensure that we can support local communities. And we're going to get to know him a bit better later on. Next up, we have Fleur Sainsbury. Hi, Fleur. Hi. Fleur joins us from Tourism Northern Territory. Fleur spent her childhood in East and Southern Africa where she got her love of travel and exploration. She has traveled the length and breadth of Northern Territory and what she doesn't know about that region is probably not worth knowing. <laughs> her Northern Territory adventures include witnessing rare rainfall in Uluru and fishing for Baramundi in Arnhem Land. And I'm very excited to pick her brains a little bit later on. And next up, we have Norai Jamil. Hi, Norai. Hey. Norai is a writer and photographer whose love for Australia started 20 years ago when her sister moved to Perth, and she considers the country to be her second home. Her adventures in Northern Territory include getting Garn train to Darwin and taking a hot air balloon over Alice Springs. She also recently updated the Northern Territory chapter in the Rough Guide to Australia, and we're going to talk to her a little bit more about that shortly. And last but not least, we have David Whitley. Hi, David. Hello. Hello. David is a freelance journalist and a contributor to National Geographic Traveller. COVID permitting, he likes to travel to Australia a couple of times a year to explore the different regions. He's written several Australia features for us before, including one on Coburg Peninsula, one of the most remote areas in Northern Territory. He also runs Australia Travel Questions, a website dedicated to honest travel advice when it comes to exploring Australia. Now, 
that's our wonderful panel and I'm going to dive right in with my very first question. This one is a bit of a broad one and it goes out to all of you. Tell me, what makes Northern Territory such a great option for an Australian adventure? David, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, I think what makes the Northern Territory so great is it's so different. It's, um, it's what you properly imagine when you're thinking of the big sandstone escarpments, the big red dirt deserts and the vast open space. But there's so much more to it than that. There's the bit, the national parks have got so many more qualities to them than just a waterfall here and there. There's a cultural history that is so important that's linked to it as well. And the Aboriginal culture in Northern Territory is so closely linked to that landscape mm. that you can't separate them. And when you start traveling through it, you realize you're traveling through a big storybook and it's a fascinating place for those reasons. That's a brilliant answer, Fleur. I saw you passionately nodding, nodding along there. I'm guessing you agree. <laughs> I do. No, David's completely right. You know, the landscapes are epic. And I think the other thing, as you also alluded to, was how diverse the, the NT is. You know, it's six times the size of Great Britain. So you can imagine in that length and breadth of it how different the landscapes are from north to south. But I think for me, it's really the people. You know, they're warm, they're friendly. They're, they've got that larrikin sense of humour that's so quintessentially Australian. And they've always got a great story to tell and share with you. And so I think for me, it's, it's really the people um, and, and that, you know, as, as David said, that ancient culture. Wonderful. And what about you, for you, Nora? What makes it such a fantastic place for an adventure? I mean, to sort of add to what David and Fleur have just said, I've been a few times now and my parents have been in Australia for a long time. So I've been trying to see a lot of the top end of Australia. It's taken me years and I still haven't seen that much of it. Um, I've flown over Uluru and I've flown over um, Kings Canyon in helicopters and balloons. I've walked through them. I've camped in swag bags. I've been on the GAN and um, it sounds like, oh yeah, I've done it. I don't need to go again. Um, and it's, I still haven't seen half of it, more than half of it. And updating the rough guide to Australia and doing the Northern Territory chapter, I realised how much more there was that I didn't know about. <laughs> and so I've got a list of festivals that I want to go and photograph. And as a photographer too, it's endlessly beautiful. I mean, you know, the colours of the rocks. Sunrise and sunset there are beyond anything you've ever seen anywhere in the world, I think. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased because I mostly, you know, I move between Perth and, w and, and London a lot. But the NT is really quintessential red centre, proper Australia. And when you see it, you go, OK, this is what they're talking about. Yeah. And you get addicted. I am addicted. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> I will jump in there and agree with on the photography. I'm a dreadful photographer and I've still got some stunning photos from the Northern Territory. The light's just amazing. Yeah. And what about you, Justin, as our resident Australian, what's your relationship with the region and why do you think it's so, so fantastic? Yeah, I think um, Australians have a terrible history of, we love to travel, but we love to go overseas. And so often we, we leave Australia till the end. Uh, we have the grey nomad, the grey nomad to go around in their caravan into Australia. So I think um, for the Northern Territory in particular, it's kind of um, uh, for a lot of Australians, the place of pilgrimage. We, we grow up with this understanding of the great red outback and the Uluru and this great uh, kind of monolith in the outback. And so I think um, my personal relationship with the Northern Territory and the outback is that it's, it's kind of uh, a bucket list item to kind of put it crudely. But it's that, it's that place of pilgrimage and to kind of see something that's so central to our identity um, is really quite special to see. And it's exactly what Nora and David were saying. It's just this really raw sense of what Australia is. And it just feels so vast and epic. It's, it's really incredible. Fantastic. Now, you said it's vast and epic, and that leads me nicely onto my next question. It is vast. And for someone who's planning their first trip there, it might be quite overwhelming. Where do they start, Fleur? If someone's never been there before, where on earth do they begin? What must they see as a first timer? Okay, so good question. I think most first time travelers would, to Australia even, not just the territory, would head to the Red Center. I think it's so iconic. You see it on the front of every travel brochure in, a, in, a, in an agency. So I think that would be the, their first port of call, Alice Springs as a launching pad to the, the wider Red Center, Uluru, 
Catatuta, Kings Canyon. Uh, but I wouldn't dismiss Darwin in the top end, you know, I think it's it's perhaps more visited by people that are repeat visitors to Australia that are on their second, third, fourth trip. But I really think Darwin is a great place to start your Australian holiday. It's only four, hour, four and a bit hours from Singapore, two and a bit hours from Bali. So it's it cuts a chunk of time off flying to the East Coast. And um, it's a tropical, you know, the weather is tropical. It's a beautiful city. What a better place to start your, your holiday than there, I'd say. Wonderful. Nora, are you are nodding along? Yeah, I love Darwin. Um, I hadn't, the first time I did a big tour of Australia, and the first time I went there was for three months, my sister got married, and I, I did like, a, kind of did the whole continent, but you know, the hotspots. Um, and when I went back, and I went on a trip that Fleur was involved in organising for me, actually, and I started in the Red Centre and ended up in Darwin, and I could have stayed in Darwin for a lot longer. Um, I was kind of blown away by it, and then I obviously wanted to go on go to the Tiwi Islands and lots of other places that I've, I'll sort of, that's a hub for. Um, I love the people in Darwin. I love, I stayed in a hostel. You meet all kinds of amazing people from all over the world that are going off on different road trips and offering to drive you here, there and everywhere. Um, yeah, food and drink. It's kind of juicy as well, isn't it, Darwin? You can do that sort of, you know, you can have a little bit of the cocktail hour, then you can go back to your swag bag and do a tour of Kakadu. Yeah, it's, an, it's a really good spot. So yeah, you're right, Fleur. Next trip. Definitely, <laughs> D Darwin. Fantastic. I'm a big, big fan of Darwin too. It's it's a place that doesn't feel like anywhere else. Mm. It's you, you expect the sort of outback Larrikin character, but there's an Asian vibe to it. There's a bit bit of a Bohemian vibe as well, and there's the Aboriginal vibe, and they all mix in mm. a place that's manageable, relatively small, and it's got a lot of tourist attractions. It's mm. I mean. Sydney and Melbourne are obviously the two big cities in Australia that people go to, but I would put Darwin as the third um, choice if you're going for an Australian city because it is completely unlike anywhere else. And in that top end area, you can easily have a week in the top end where you have a few days in Darwin and then do a loop around Litchfield National Park where you've got the massive termite mounds and the waterfalls. Catherine Gorge in Nitmalock National Park where the gorge cruises and kayaking and then you can drive through Kakadu where there's crocodile cruises, the great big escarpments, the waterfalls, the works and it's such an easy loop route round there that is a perfect one week of your Australian trip up there. Mm, fantastic. What about you Justin, where was the first place that you went to and, and where would you recommend people go to for the first time? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I'm actually quite jealous listening to Nora and David and Flora because I haven't been to Darwin yet. Uh, <laughs> so I've been like a typical bad domestic Australian traveller, so I can't <laughs> wait to get up there. Uh, I've got a friend who did a pub crawl by helicopter up in Darwin last week. Which I'm yeah, that's an actual thing. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, but in terms of uh, my, so I've been to Alice Springs in the Uluru, that was my first kind of trip to the Northern Territory, uh, and I hold a special place in my heart because it was a, uh, my first assignment as a travel journalist, so uh, being able to kind of uh, live that dream and, you know, see the, uh, we had champagne sunrise at Uluru, which is spectacular, because as Nora kind of said before, it's amazing for photography when you get that golden hour, that you pretty much can't take a bad photo of it <laughs> uh, and if you do you got your champagne to kind of um wash it away uh, and then you get up the next morning and you can do a, a sunrise uh, kind of hike around the base of all the road well uh, with the traditional owner which is a really fantastic way to kind of understand the scale of what you're looking at but also its cultural significance to to the local people um that's quite special that does sound special i i want to talk um, a little bit about getting around now, it's such a vast region. Would you recommend to hire a car and do an epic road trip? Or how about if someone doesn't drive? Is it easy to explore it via public transport? Nora, I can see you nodding. Well, I, I went on the train from, from Alice to Darwin. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like it's such an, an amazing experience anyway. And you, you obviously get off and you can go to Catherine and do all kinds of trips on the way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of really interesting people on the train itself. So you have that experience while you see the landscapes going by. I mean, I know, David, I think you drove, didn't you? You've done quite a lot of driving, but I tend yeah. to, if I'm with friends or on my own, I generally don't drive because it is a long way. <laughs> and I've got my camera gear and I want to be doing other things. So for me, the train was amazing and I would do that again. Um, I love that experience. It was beyond, yeah. And the train itself is beautiful. 
So just to sort of see it from the outside and the history of that, of that Fleur probably knows a bit more than I do, but it's got a very long history. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've done it two ways. I've um, I've um, been in the top end and driven around there, and I've done it on day tours and multi-day tours as well. So if you're not driving, it's very easy to get on a tour that takes you for three, four days around the top end. Same in the centre. You can fly into Uluru. You don't need a car there. There's shuttle buses that take you to Uluru, and the um, you can get tours to Kings Canyon and Catatuta as well. Um, I've way I did it and the way I enjoyed it most was driving all the way through the middle of Australia. I started in Melbourne actually and just drove up all the way through and that trip up the Stuart Highway, you just it's fascinating watching the landscapes change. It starts at really stark red dirt and salt bush and slowly as you go north it gets more tropical and suddenly you're in with, um, with um, termite mounds, big trees, floodplains and it's it's that sense of journey that makes it a fascinating way to see the country. There's not an awful lot in between the top end and the red centre, but what is there um, is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, just to jump in there, I think there's this perception that, you know, Australia is vast. It's a massive country. And if you want to drive from end to end, it will take you a long time. But if there's people travelling on a limited time frame they got you know maybe one or two weeks and they're just trying to fit in a shorter holiday and they're not trying to backpack for six months uh alice springs and darwin are very accessible just by plane you can get to them by most i think all the major airports from all the major cities and as dave said they've really they're really set up well for short-term travelers so i think for people watching and listening like that you don't need to commit <laughs> a huge chunk of your life if you do want to go and see these places yeah. I, sorry, uh, I, I, joined, I joined a tour as well, a photography tour that went out of Alice and so it hit all the spots and we, we, we camped in swag bags for about a week in the desert and that was one of the most incredible things I've ever done in my life and really sort of took me out of my comfort zone and now that's become my norm. I really like to be under the stars. I don't worry about animals anymore and being, I don't know, merged in my bed. Sorry, it was so beautifully safe. <laughs> There's a big group of us around a campfire. You're, you know, basically in this sort of desert night air, you're, you're all tucked up in your kind of doona in your swag bag. So your bedding's basically on the floor, but it's like having a single bed. It's so comfortable. It's quite difficult to roll it in the morning. That becomes a thing you learn to do every day. Mm -hmm. I think I got it right on the last day, but it goes on the top of the truck and then you drive on. I would really recommend doing an overland tour with a group. It's such good fun. And there's the, there's the, uh, the thousand star dinner. That you're referring to Nora, where you, you have dinner out under the stars before obviously because I'm asleep, which is just spectacular. Yeah. And if you do a tour, you cook your own dinner, you you know, you together as a group, you know, you get to make the damp bread and you can, you know, you can do some of the barbecuing. You've always got everyone's got a cask of red wine. It's amazing. I honestly, I would go and do that now. I want to be a grey nomad. So in Australia, when people get to retirement, they, you know about this, Justin, um, they just chase the sun and usually go from the south to the top end in the, in the winter and they just drive around and they usually drive around the, the, the red centre and the top end and that's going to be me and not too much further in the future, probably. <laughs> I think the other great thing about touring over self-drive, and it, it, it's horse, horses for courses, it's about how much time and, and money and, and what you want to get out of your trip. But the great thing about touring is obviously it's guided. So you're getting those insights, both culturally, landscapes, wildlife, you're getting that story told and access to places that you might not even know exist if you were in a car by yourself um, as, a, as a tourist. So I think there's, it's all about what, what you personally want to get out of the trip really. Mm. Mm, to give you an example of that, just to add to what Fleur said, like um, I did a, a guided tour around um, the desert park in Alice Springs with a chef and he was stopping and he was like, oh, look at this kind of like uh, little fruit. You wouldn't, it's so dried out and shriveled, you wouldn't even think of the fruit, but that's just how things are in Australia. And he's like, you know, this is a Quandong. It had 10,000 more vitamins than an orange. And just those are the little kind of things that you barely find on the internet, let alone if you're just traipsing on through by yourself. So a guided tour is definitely a good way to see things. Mm, fantastic. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about both Darwin and Alice Springs shortly. But what I want to know is, like we said, the region uh, is so vast and full of unspoiled nature. In your opinion, what makes it uh, so great for outdoor enthusiasts? If somebody doesn't necessarily want to visit 
spend too much time in the cities they just want to immerse themselves in the surrounding what makes it just such a great place for someone like that Fleur let's start with you yeah I was gonna say I'll take that one if you like um well I think the great thing about the territory is its climate you know it's got really great climate so life is lived outdoors so for people that love the outdoors it's an absolutely perfect place to be and it is a very active destination depending on you know your what you want to do and, and your physical ability there's mountain bike trails all around Alice Springs. It's a real mecca for mountain bikers. So that's really, really great. There's things like hot air ballooning and quad biking across the Red Centre as well. And in the top end, lots of walking trails. I mean, there's walking in the Red Centre too, actually. There's walking across the territory. So if you're into your walks, there's things like the Jack Buller Trail out of Catherine, the Lara Pinta Trail out of Alice Springs, and several shorter walks in Kakadu um, as well. So really, um, depending on, on what you want to, to do, there's there's heaps. Kayaking on, on uh, Catherine Gorge in Nitmaluk as well. So yeah, heaps of things to keep you busy if you love that sort of stuff. Oh, fantastic. Nora, what about you? Have you ever embarked on any of these trails that uh, Fleur just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, some of the trips that I've done. So I did a trip um, going into Uluru, as I said, the Overland trip. We did a lot of kind of walks on that trip. So every day there was a day walk when we went into Catherine. Um, then we camped at Catherine Gorge. And then I obviously did, I think I just put a photograph on Instagram actually. Then I went over that in a helicopter. Um, then I went up to Kakadu and did a few days in Kakadu and that was sort of staying there as well. So a lot of swimming, there's a lot of um, gorges and just beautiful um, water spots there that you might not consider is part of the desert, um, but yeah, it's really beautiful. It's very pastoral. I'm actually doing a photography project at the moment and I'm editing some photographs from the Northern Territory. And some of those landscapes are just, you know, um, if you like nature, there's, there's so much wildlife as well. I mean, black-footed rock wallabies and obviously the crocodiles that we know about. There's some little, really cute little crocs that you can actually wade past in some of the gorges. They're really little. They're not the ones, you know, to be worried about. Um, and then there's all kinds of, we saw dingoes, I've seen snakes and spiders. I'm not scared of any of that now. I quite like to look for that, and obviously with a guide in a safe way, but it's quite nice as part of Australia. Um, isn't it Fleur? <laughs> it's, yeah, not, exactly. it's nothing to be frightened about you know I, I don't know when people say to me there's so many of this it's like yeah but I might have seen one spider you know once. I was gonna say I've been going to the Northern Territory since the mid 90s and I don't think I've ever encountered a snake or a spider. Crocs obviously are our, our biggest sort of concern in the top end you don't want to swim anywhere where it says not to for sure but um beyond that yeah you're right Nora you're right so um, yeah nothing nothing to be concerned about. Right. And they're more scary birds. than you are them. Yes, right. yeah. yeah. But there's so many oh, birds. Just stay away from the water's edge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bird life's amazing. So Kakadu has, I think, one third of Australian's bird species. So, you know, that's an incredible statistic in its own right. So if you are a birder, that is a place to head to for sure. Yeah. And even if you're not, it's really beautiful. You kind of, you're just surrounded by bird song as well. If you're up at dawn to see the sunrise. Yeah, it, it's very beautiful. It is. So the walk in the Red Centre as well is incredible. Um, the walk around Uluru, everybody knows that one picture of Uluru because they all get taken from the one place. It, it changes vastly as you walk around it. There's gullies, there's where waterfalls have been. There's been there's little outcrops of plants. There's li little places where wildlife lives. It looks so different all the way around. And the main reason that you don't see those other pictures of it is the traditional owners request that you don't put those pictures, publish those pictures. But you see so many different sides to it. It's a remarkable walk around. And for anyone who is thinking, I'm not gonna go because I can't climb it anymore. Don't worry about that. It's far more interesting to walk around it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the likes of Catatuta where it's big rock domes um, about 50 kilometers away, something like that. Um, and the big walk, walk through that snakes through all the rock domes. And then the other, the third one in the trio is Kings Canyon, which is a massive canyon full a, a, a river runs through it and the first part of that walk is one of the most horrendous things you'll ever do um, but it's well worth it when you get to the top yeah it's short but it's um it's pretty challenging isn't it i have to stop about heart halfway. attack hill i think it's called isn't it it's, they call it heart attack hill yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I just want to add, uh, with um, crocodiles and that kind of thing, if you're in the top end around Darwin, I agree with Dave, you want to be careful where you go, but there's this kind of misconception that there's crocodiles everywhere in Australia, uh, but in Alice Springs, they're not there. And there's a whole heap of, um, uh, outside of Alice Springs, there's a whole heap of water and swimming holes you can go swim in, which is just 
beautiful. It's just rainwater or spring fed. Uh, usually not many people there. You've got the whole place to yourself with the big echoing kind of um, valley walls to kind of make it feel really special. Uh, and there's no crocodiles, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> you can go splash about and you're safe. Phew. Um, I want to take it back to Alice Springs and Darwin. Now, some people might think that um, you might fly into one or the other and have to drive thousands of miles to get to see some incredible things. But each place, each city and each uh, town, they have some pretty fantastic things within easy reach. Um, so starting with Darwin, for example, how, how would you spend a perfect weekend there? Nora? Um, I guess Darwin, it depends if you've maybe either side of a trip to Kakadu, you might be in Darwin for a few days and kind of it's a really nice antidote if you have been out in your swag and you have been sort of, you know, out camping and walking, getting sweaty, which is lovely. Um, it's, it's a nice sort of city break. So you've got restaurants, but Darwin's also got a lot of Aboriginal culture. So there's galleries. Um, you can do local tours. There's a lot of Indigenous owned tourism in that area. So Personally, that's what I'd be doing, some cultural tours, probably go and look at some art, maybe buy something, I always buy something local. Um, I'd eat a lot and I'd be drinking some lovely Australian wine, probably, and obviously coffee, because Australians love their coffee. That's what I'd be doing in Darwin, because it would be the end of, you know, a, a long road trip or, a, or some walking or something. So it would be my chance to decompress and do a bit of culture and have a bit of a gastronomic weekend. That's what I would do. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? A lot of people might think that they fly into Alice Springs or Darwin and then head straight out into somewhere incredibly far away. But how would you, you know, what are some of the your favourite places in and around those two destinations? Um, Darwin, my favourite place is the Mindel Beach night markets. Um, it's it's one of those markets that's not really for shopping it's for soaking up the atmosphere it's full of street entertainers musicians loads of food stalls and then as the sun goes down everyone stops and walks onto the beach and just watch the sun goes down it feels like a real communal moment that is something far more than just visiting a market there's also a lot of interesting world war ii history in darwin that people don't know about the um, at Stokes Hill Wharf, I think it is, there's the Royal Flying Doctor mm -hmm. Service Museum that you can basically put on these 3D um, goggles and you're suddenly in the middle of a Japanese bombing raid. It's great and it's really well done. And so there's those aspects to Darwin and places like Litchfield National Park, that's a very easy day trip away. You don't have to do Litchfield as a big camping out expedition. You can do that as an easy day trip from Darwin and you can swim in the rock pools, swim in the water under the waterfalls, see the giant termite mounds. It's great. Fantastic. We actually have a really great article on our website about how to spend three or four days in each destination and everything that there is to do within it and around it. So hopefully one of my colleagues will post that. Um, and that uh, Justin, what about Alice Springs? So how would you spend your ideal kind of two or three days if you were yeah, for it, say for the first time? Yeah, if I was there for the first time, I would hire a car and I would all bike and I would pedal out to the, um, the swimming holes in the West McDonald Ranges uh, with a picnic uh, because it's just a really great way to spend uh, most of your day just kind of, you can just hop between them and they're all a little bit different and you can choose to do a hike with them or just go straight into the water. That's a really great way to kind of spend your first day. Then... Uh, I, I cannot recommend highly enough, and I can't mention before, doing an overnight at Uluru. Uh, so you can do an overnight tour. Um, you drive down, do your little champagne and sunset uh, experience, and then get up in the morning again, and then come back to Alice. Uh, and then within Alice, there's a really great um, art scene. Uh, there's a really great Aboriginal art scene. Uh, the, the, I think it's coming out the Araluan uh, art center and I'll drop that into the chat after this uh, where you can it's really it's really quite modern and contemporary you can do some really cool stuff and I think um, they display art from a variety of different Aboriginal tribes and cultures in the area so it's really quite interesting to see how diverse and different they all are um, mm -hmm. so I think that's a good way to kind of get a hit of the icons the, the scenery and then a bit of the culture as well. Fleur, there's a lot of Indigenous-owned tours around um, the Uluru um, 
There are, yeah, a lot of, in fact, even Ayers Rock Resort, which you wouldn't necessarily think of, is Indigenous owned um, and has a training school for Indigenous um, people to come and learn hospitality. And then those people are uh, recruited across Australia into hospitality. So, you know, it's doing some really important work down there as well. But yeah, um, lots of Indigenous tours, lots of Indigenous guides working for non-Indigenous companies as well. So I definitely recommend if you can get an Indigenous guide, try and do so because, you know, they're fascinating. Their, their story is fascinating. They're really gentle people and they always, you know, are really happy to engage with you. I think... Great. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, David, carry on. Yeah, one great thing I did at um, Bullaroo was um, dot painting workshops yeah. with an yeah, that's Aboriginal cool. guide and they teach you how to do the dot paintings and they teach you the significance of the symbols and the colours and it was absolutely eye-opening. It was fascinating. I love doing that. I've done it a few times. It's with Maraku Arts. I've just popped it in the chat. Um, they, You can do that. It's a little one-hour workshop and um, an Indigenous um, lady normally comes and sits in the sand and teaches you what the, all the symbols mean and then you can take you do your own little piece of, of art and then you get that to take home it's really brilliant incredible you guys have just answered my next question and that was what if so what would you recommend for someone exploring the region's indigenous culture do have we missed anything out are there any kind of um particular galleries or anything that you'd like well there's to the <clears throat> there's the rock art galleries in the north in the top end in kakadu uh, in particular there's um ubia and it's the Anne Bambang Gallery in Nulangi. I might have pronounced those wrong. I apologise if so. Um, but they've got the rock art that's been there for thousands of years. And you can see it's a historical record because there are things there that date how old those paintings are. There's one where you've got a person turning up with a gun. That is clearly from the last 200 years. There's another one where they've got turtles and fish that's got to be within the last 2000 years because the flood painters weren't there before that and then there's some with thylacines or tasmanian devils as i know they're at least 5000 years old because they were wiped out about 5000 years ago so these rock art paintings all the way around these sandstone rock galleries and caves are a historical record as well as just art yeah, I agree. I've been, my favourite place in the Territory, or one of my favourite places, it's hard to pick, is Arnhem Land. And I know it's not necessarily a first time a destination, but if you have been to the Territory before and you're thinking about going back, it's amazing. It's 90,000 square kilometres west of Kakadu. It's indigenous land. You need a permit to enter, or if you book a tour, they'll sort all that out for you. But the rock art there is like Kakadu on steroids. It's, <laughs> it's mind blowing. And the not only how old it is, but the, the beauty of it. And indigenous people, paint on top of paintings. So you'll see multiple layers um, in these caves and over sort of cliff overhangs. And it just takes your breath away. You feel so, so sort of privileged to be there and it makes you, it gives you some perspective on the world, I think, and how small and insignificant we are sometimes. It's really special. Fascinating. Um, now we've talked about some pretty iconic attractions like Uluru. When somebody thinks of Northern Territory, that might be what they think of. But for you guys, what is that one unsung hero when it comes to Northern Territory? The secret that you don't want to give away, but you must, because I'm asking you. What's, what's the one place or attraction? Um, Flo, let's go back to you. Okay, I'm gonna pick one for the top end and one for the red center. I've already just touched on Arnhem Land. I think if you can um, add a couple more days onto your trip, I would highly recommend it. It's like nowhere, you'll ever go again. It is truly special, um, not only for its its culture and its art, but its wildlife. And it's just, it's it's so pristine um, in terms of its landscapes that I think, you know, it's a, it's a really special place to, to see if you can. And in the Red Centre, Justin touched on it earlier. I think the Madonna Rangers are just such an unsung hero. They're an easy drive to the <laughs> Palace, lots of great swimming, as he said, take a picnic. Um, they're, they're beautiful and easy to explore. Mm -hmm. Justin, would that be yours? The yeah, that would be mine. That, that completely took me by surprise when I was there because uh, I, I didn't really know a lot when I first time I went. And um, seeing those swimming holes and those areas are just really beautiful and it's quite intimate and slow paced and you can mm -hmm. do it on your own. It, yeah, it's quite special. Fantastic. Nora, where's your one unsung hero of Northern Territory? I keep going back to Ormiston Gorge, which is just just so beautiful. I mean, you, that is on the trail. And if you do any sort of organised tours, they will take you there. Um, but it wasn't somewhere I knew about before I went there. So they're all, you go to a lot of these places that are kind of, you know, huge kind of cathedral-like um, rock 
um, chasms and the places that are on the way to the big places are sometimes the most beautiful. Um, there are a lot of gorges, as I said, and I, I really want to go to the Tiwi Islands. So if we're talking about the top end, I still haven't made it, but when I was researching the rough guide, that was going to be my next trip. And then obviously the pandemic stopped all that. Um, but I, I planned my trip out and I think that might be a little bit of a, a hidden gem. Um, yeah, I'm, I think Fleur would agree. She knows a lot more about it. But no, I definitely Tiwi Islands is definitely up there. Two hours by ferry from Darwin. It's an amazing day trip. Um, really, sort of getting into the heart of an indigenous community, seeing their art, learning about their culture. It's yeah, brilliant. Good suggestion. Fantastic. I will go. I will go for. Coburg Peninsula, which is right at the top of the Arnhem Lands. Um, there's, there's wilderness camps up there. There's the big creek crossings, there's crocodiles. There's a lost city hidden amongst the rainforest. It's It feels completely untouched and pristine. Um, my second one would be, if you're doing that big drive up the middle of the um, country, the Daily Waters pub, um, which is the classic Australian pub where I have probably um, engineered my worst ever hangover. <laughs> it was, uh, Excellent. Uh, it's, um, it's covered in banknotes and underwear from all over the world. There's live um, bands playing and everyone just sits outside, has as many beers as they like and then regrets it the next morning <laughs> but it's a it's a yeah. classic australian pub it's the sort of place that you dream about going to when you're thinking of australia that's what i was going to say actually it's yeah. the places on the road where you stop the road houses the sheep stations where you meet all the kind of real characters they're some of the highlights of, of any trip in australia so mm -hmm. don't worry about sort of making the road journey shorter because it's every stop every pit stop is is hilarious mm -hmm. um and you want to stay a bit longer yeah and you meet some real characters and you think i've only had a couple more nights here so yeah yeah definitely the pit stops the road houses the pubs definitely the kind of stuff you wouldn't easily find on Google. I always find yeah. the, best yeah, the things you hit, the things you hit by almost accident, or because there's nothing else there. That's <laughs> exactly. Um, now we're on to my favourite subject, and that is food. <laughs> what can visitors expect in the culinary scene of Northern Territory, and where are some of your guys' favourite uh, places to eat, to drink? What can they expect? um who wants to go first let's go to you justin I might, yeah i might jump in there um uh, with alice springs uh uh there's quite a lot on offer and it could just suit a lot of different budgets as well so you know they've got todd mall which is kind of um a bit a uh, bit of a market you can kind of grab a bunch of different things you get fried noodles stews curries um and i think todd mall kind of like uh, the emblematic of much of Australia, you know, we're a very multicultural country, uh, so you can get quite a diversity of food within the Alice Springs area. Um, there's a good uh, Indian place called Flavors of India, because um, we've got a strong Indian uh, heritage here. Um, but I just want to highlight one place called Kungas Can Cook, uh, which is an Aboriginal owned and operated cafe uh, where they work with the local mob to use uh, wild native food. So a lot of people, when they travel, obviously want to taste authentic local food. Uh, in Australia, we're still building up our native food uh, kind of uh, experiences, but that's a really good place. If you want to know what a, a wild bush plum tastes like or a finger lime or anything like that, that's a good place to go. Mm -hmm. Nora, I'll drop that in the chat. Yeah, yeah that, that's something that I was really interested in looking at the sort of um, native food scene. You know, there are different seasons as well. So there's all kinds of different foods that you can sort of look into, which is why I would say traveling, going on at least on a, on a kind of um, a bush tucker tour or something, or just a, a food tour with a with an indigenous or, the, or with a local person that knows what they're talking about. That's always really good fun. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, David, were you about to say something? Um, and I believe there's a bush tucker tour you can do at um, Uluru, um, which takes you through um, the um, traditional uses for the plants and how they're used. Um, but there's also the Sounds of Silence dinner at Uluru, which you have out in the open on the top of sand dune, overlooking the big red rock. Um, they have multi-course dinner. Australian wine, there's some native ingredients. You can have kangaroo as well. Kangaroo meat is fantastic if you lightly sear it it's beautiful and and they do a stargazing session showing the southern hemisphere sky afterwards so 
that's not necessarily the greatest food you'll have in the Northern Territory. There are some great restaurants in Darwin and there's a, a vast multicultural scene in Darwin. But mm. that sounds a silence dinner. If you're after a, a experienced dinner, that's pretty special. Also, I would, I would say that if you do any of those overland tours, it's amazing what the guides rustle up. You have no idea what they've got stored for you for every meal. They will get emu, kangaroo, all kinds of things, crocodile meat. You know, sometimes they'll trick you into something, say it's something else and it isn't. Um, but they really cook up a storm. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, they'll trick you. But they're, they're, you know, they're Australian guys. They're quite funny. Um, but I have eaten so well on all the road trips I've done. I've done quite a few in, in, the, in West, West Australia as well as Northern Territory. I haven't ever had a really, really amazing meal it's always been beyond this like restaurant quality so don't think you're roughing it if you're doing a road trip mm -hmm. it's really kind of yeah they you like your food and drink don't you justin you Aussies? you know what you're doing yeah yeah i gotta say one of my favorite meals was uh doing the thousand uh, dinner that david uh referred to and having a kangaroo uh curry uh which was just amazing and the guy just cooked it on the fire in front of us and you know it's great great conversation great food yeah amazing Blair, what about you? Where are some of your favourite places to eat and types of cuisine? There's so much. As everyone sort of said, Darwin in particular is such a melting pot. It's got so um, so many sort of influences from not only Asia, but Europe too. So you can go to the markets. The markets are kind of my thing in Darwin. I love whether it's Mindle Beach or Nightcliff or Parap on the weekend. You can get a laxa, you can get a smoothie, sublaki, whatever you fancy. You know, there's, there's something and it's not expensive. You can pick up dinner for like 10 bucks. So... But then on the other flip side of that, we have fine dining as well. You know, if you've got, got the, the money and you want to splash out, I would say in Darwin, um, head to um, East Point where you've got uh, peewees on the point. It's uh, fine dining, but it's on all the tables are on the lawns and you're facing back towards Darwin City. The harbour's lapping at the shore, beautiful seafood. That's something that the territory does really well. It's our own local produce, as well as all the influences from Asia. We do amazing beef, amazing seafood, tropical fruit, obviously. Um, and then down south, I would say Alice Springs. Go, uh, if you're catching up with mates or family, um, go to Monty's in Alice Springs for, for a good catch up. Page 27 does the best breakfast. Epilogue Lounge is great for dinner. And at Uluru, uh, a bit like Sounds of Silence, but a bit more luxe is Taliwiru. And that is a fine dining four course dinner atop a sand dune with views of Uluru and Katatuta, paired wines. Um, star talk indigenous um, music it's really special mm. so yeah in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> um, I have time for one more question before I open the Q&A section to our audience and this one goes out to uh, Fleur and Norai and that is in terms of discovering the region by yourself especially if you're a woman how safe is it and should 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 I be worried at all if I was to explore it by myself? Personally I've always had really amazing experiences in Australia. I have traveled a little bit on my own with friends in a group with a partner with family <laughs> but it's 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 I find it a very safe very welcoming very friendly culture like what I remember once taking a photograph near some water first time I ever went to the Northern Territory and I was quite young I'm not going to say how old I am now but I was a lot younger than I am now and people kept stopping in their cars to say don't photograph there there are crocs and it was like I knew because there was a big sign that said don't don't go in the water and I wasn't going to everyone kept stopping because they saw a tourist and thought fool you know she, <laughs> but it was lovely and I thought oh I really feel like everyone's looking out for me yeah people are really friendly you know you know you go into a pub as well as a young woman on your own and people will talk to you and yeah I, I like Aussies they, they you know it's I find I find it very safe and there's so many tours you can do if you want to do that on your own for reading you know you don't have to sort of like find your way as I said, when I stayed in a hostel in Darwin, there's, you know, like all hostels around the world, there's groups that are driving to one place and you can book a really well-organized tour. So you don't actually have to do it on your own. You can fly in and do your little hub trips from, from Alice, you know, go on the trains, very safe, go up to Darwin, go to Kakadu with an organized tour, that kind of thing, if you're a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure David would get in the car if he was me and just do the whole thing driving, but yeah. Yeah, I just like road trips, so. <laughs> 
So yeah. would you agree with Nora? What I, Nora I would, yeah. yeah. Um, I first went to Australia as a backpacker when I was 21 in the 90s. Again, I'm like Nora, I'm not going to tell you exactly when. Um, <laughs> but um, and I that my, my in that in that sort of eight month trip around the country, I did visit the Northern Territory. Um, and you know, uh, as a 21 year old literally knew no one, knew nothing really, when you think back, um, jumped on a camping tour, flew, flew into Alice from the East Coast, um, jumped on a camping tour by myself, um, and it was it was completely fine. And I've been, obviously I've been back to the territory many, many times, but I do travel alone, because um, I'm always off to explore the next place. You know, there's so many places even now that I haven't been to and I'm desperate to get to. So I, yeah, I would definitely, I mean, like common sense like anywhere, isn't it? But oh, I've never yeah. felt unsafe or, or unsafe, you know, in, in the territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's really good to know, fantastic. Um, they're all my questions. So now I'm gonna open it up to the audience and we've got some pretty good ones coming in. The first one being climate and the best time of year to visit. Um, David. When May to October. I, I'm sure Fleur will say it's beautiful in the green season up north, but that basically is when it's raining. May to October, it's a lot drier. <laughs> um, and in, in the north, it's beautiful weather, hardly any rain. Um, you, if you go start of May, um, end of May, beginning of June, you can see the waterfalls as well in full flow. Um, and the floodplains are still there. Um, also in the red centre, it's a lot cooler. Those walks are not as oppressive in the heat and there are fewer flies. So it's, it's a much more pleasant time to go. So the Australian winter, British summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Justin, do you agree? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think for for Alice Springs and kind of uh, down south, um, you definitely want to go in the shoulder season. So in autumn, or our autumn and our spring. Uh, mm -hmm. Just as, as David said, it's less intense, um, but it is a great place to visit all year round. It's because it is in the outback, it is quite consistent <laughs> um, throughout most of the year, but you would just help avoid those kind of extremes if you go in the shoulder seasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really good to know. Yeah, Flo, were you about to say something? Yeah, I was. I was going to say, I mean, yes, our peak season definitely is May to October, and that's when the majority of people will visit. But I think if you do, as I say, want to see the waterfalls in full flow, if you want cheaper rates, if you want less crowds, um, then I would consider going in our off season, which is November to March. Mm -hmm. It does rain, but it's it's monsoonal. So, you know, it's like being in far North Queensland or Singapore. You get those heavy torrential downpours in the afternoon for about an hour or two. They clear up, sun comes back out and it's good and it brings the humidity down. So you will have to be a little bit flexible with your itinerary planning if you go at that time of year, because if we do get heavy rainfalls, and that's something about that time of year is you never really know how much rain we're gonna get. Sometimes we get none and other times we get heat. So it's really so varied, but it might mean that roads get closed at short notice. So um, if you're self-driving, you just have to build some flexibility into your itinerary. If you want to tour, it's no worries. They'll take care of all that for you and just replan the route. Okay, fantastic. We have another question, and this one is about outdoor swimming areas. What are some pools or uh, safe waters to, to swim in in Northern Territory? Anyone can jump in for this one. I'd say yeah. in Darwin. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry Lich Litchfield, I would say, would okay. be which is an easy day trip from Darwin. It's completely safe to swim there. Amazing rock, um, rock pools and waterfalls. Um, so Wangi Falls, uh, Bewley Rock Hole. Um, yeah. That's a that's a my, my top tip. Probably avoid kakadu. Okay. David, sorry, back to you. What were um, you yeah, in Darwin as well. There's a couple of massive artificial um, lagoons on the Esplanade. One of them, which is a wave yeah. pool, the Wave Lagoon, you just go swimming in there. It's a, a giant open air pool. That sounds fantastic. And how about how about you, Nora? Have you, have <laughs> you been swimming anywhere in, in the region? Have I been swimming? Hmm. I was told when I was on my way to the airport to fly out of Darwin that the only place you swim in the NT is your back guard, your backyard swimming pool. Oh, no. Um, Don't say but, that. <laughs> no, but I had been swimming in Billabongs. I had been swimming in Kakadu. Um, okay. When I went, we were with guides. They had they had checked the area. There were some places which you could swim in. Sometimes at the top of escarpments, you get little bits of water and you can swim in those. And it, it felt very safe to me. But also, you know around Alice, the Alice, uh, when you're coming out of there, there's a lot of, as Justin was saying, you can do those little day trip. Um, there's a lot of swimming holes and gorges and they're very safe around that area. So, yeah. Okay. I love to swim. 
Justin, you're nodding. Did you want to add anything to that? Oh, I was just going to, as, as Nora said, there's lots of great uh, places outside Alice Springs. Um, I put a, the couple, I named, named a couple in the chat, Ormist and Gorge, which Nora had mentioned before, and Ellery Creek. Ellery Creek is really quite close and just beautiful. So they're safe, there's no crocodiles, um, go to town. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, we have a couple more questions, and this one takes us back to food. If you are a vegetarian, can you find good veggie food in Northern Territory? Yeah, Is what I was saying about the tropical fruits. I mean, the fruits are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you like your smoothies or you like your I don't know even barbecued mangoes and things like that. I, I yeah, you could. There's everything. I think Fleur probably can add to that. But yeah, I was going to say because there's such an Asian influence in across the territory, not just in Darwin. There's some amazing Asian restaurants in um, Alice as well. Veggie um, food is is really really easy to come by. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be concerned at all um, with finding that um, if you're booking a trip. Um, vegetarianism and veganism is is growing in popularity in Australia. It's quite a wave. Um, I know in the UK, I think you've got Veganuary um, and that kind of thing. It's really quite popular here. And uh, if you're if, if you are vegan or vegetarian, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Mm. Okay, that's really good to know. Um, we have another question about budgeting. And um, this one is particularly about focusing on transport. But I want to ask, if you are exploring the region on a budget in terms of transport, in terms of hiring a guide, in terms of eating out, how affordable is it? Be honest. Uh, do you have options, you know, very affordable street food and then the high end? Yeah. Uh, you have all of it. Well, yeah, we've got we've got hostels um, and backpacker tours, you know, across the territory. So, and I, I, that's my first experience of the territory as a backpacker. So, I've stayed in hostels and I've done those tours where, you, as Nora says, you you know, camping in swags, um, and that is a really affordable and really fun way to do it. You're going to meet really interesting people from all over the world um, and go on an adventure. But um, and also, like I said earlier, you know, if you want to grab dinner at the markets um, or all the hostels have kitchens you can cook yourself if you want but you're going to pick up dinner for for a few dollars seriously mm. um on the flip side of that you know we have luxury lodges we have bespoke touring um private guiding so it, it's just really there's anything that you depending on your budget um there's anything available really okay. i don't think anyone would say australia is cheap no. but it can be done relatively cheaply pub meals cost roughly the same as they do in the uk and they're generally big hearty and quite good um you can always self-cater fairly easily and there's the markets and the food stalls um you can, if you want to eat on the cheap in terms of transport costs you're obviously covering big distances if you're driving but petrol is about i think it's about 30 percent cheaper in australia than it is in the uk so that balances out a little bit okay the things, the things for me that were expensive were like helicopter rides balloon rides the train because they're amazing and you know if you want to do that kind if you're a photographer and you want to get up high and take those pictures you kind of budget for that kind of thing but other than that it wasn't super expensive the first few times i went backpacking in australia at all you know and then you splurge if you want to but yeah it's affordable if you if you if you do it properly if you know what you're doing if you get your rock guide to australia this is the old one actually it's not my new one um that will tell you how you can do it on the cheap if you want to do it on a budget you can yeah of course the best thing is the walking and the swimming are free absolutely and the weather you don't need to go to the cinema because it's raining, you know, unless you go in December. No, you don't need, you don't need to go. You, you, you just go and walk outside and you've got your entertainment, really. You can buy your tinnies and drink them on the beach, you know. You don't need fancy, fancy restaurants if you can't afford them. No. <laughs> Justin, you were about to add something, I think. Oh, I was just going to say, if you are uh, a bit cost conscious, you can take advantage of the kind of economy of scale. Uh, you know, there's lots of tour companies uh, from Alice Spring doing a lot of the key highlights here. And their prices range from about like $500 Australian to $800 Australian, uh, which is quite a range. And they, they pack different things in there. So there's options, you know, if you want to do that, that, that might be a cost effective way to do it because it's all inclusive. You've got the accommodation, um, you know, the transport, you've got a group of friends to do it with. Um, that's a good option. 
Wonderful. And there are also coach, sorry, Freda, there's also coach trips, aren't there? So you can go on a big coach that will take you to um, Uluru and then you can get your accommodation. So you don't have to hire a vehicle. You don't have to hire an expensive overland trip. You can just get, you know, dropped off and then do your thing and then move on again. And there are bus, there are Greyhound buses. You can take all kinds of bus trips around if you, yeah, if you're on a, on a budget. Mm, that's really useful to know. Um, I've just got my five minute warning, so I'm going to squeeze in one more question. And that is to do with booking trips and excursions. Is it better to do it in the UK before you go out to Australia? Or should you get to Australia and then figure out what's the best option? I would say it depends how much time you've got. I mean, generally, I would say pre booking here in the UK is better because the tour operators here are negotiating rates um, and because they're buying in volume, generally they're getting a better rate than you as a, a single consumer would get. Um, and also then everything's prepaid for you. You don't really have to worry so much when you're on the ground. But if that's if you're going for like three weeks or so, but if you're going for three months, four months, then I would say book your first sort of week and then wing it. When you're there. Yeah, there's lots of tourist information centres and all the hostels and hotels have, you know, um, tour desks and things so you can you can chat to them. And also you're going to meet people, see what they've been doing. They have, might have come yeah. to the place you're going to and um, get, got some good tips. I agree. You can do it both ways. It's, yeah. e it's easy to find the tour companies that run the tours. It's not difficult to track them down. So if you want to do it while you're there, pick up the phone while you're there. Mm -hmm. Nora, you're nodding. Yeah, I would say the same, you know, if, you, if you're limited on time, you want to make sure you get to do something, book it in advance. But if you've got time to feel your way, like all travel, you're going to find on the ground advice. You're going to meet someone that says you need to go here and you go, where's that? Um, and I said, we're driving. Do you want to come with us? So, yeah, do like that too. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I find that I make an itinerary before I go somewhere. And within day one, I just cross it all off because yeah. I'm someone who's like, no, don't do that. Um, that is all we have time for tonight, I'm afraid. Thank you so much to you guys for, for joining and sharing your expertise with us today. And a special thank you to our sponsors, Australia's Northern Territory. And also thank you to everyone at home who tuned in tonight. Now, before you run away, I just want to tell you a little bit about a few of the NGT events that we have coming up. Our next Travel Geeks is on the 1st of June and we're going back to Australia, but this time to Adelaide and South Australia to explore its delicious wines. Now, as with this one, the tickets for that are free, but we do have a special VIP option where for £30, you do get a box of the wines delivered to you so you can sip on them while you watch the event. Amazing. And you can head over to the yes. website. All tickets for everything I'm about to mention you'll find on nationalgeographic.co.uk slash travel. And sticking with food, we have the mighty National Geographic Traveller Food Festival coming up on the 17th and 18th of July. We've got the likes of Aldo Zilli, Monica Galetti and Jack Stein who will be gracing the stage. And tickets for that are available now. We've got a special code at the moment, NGT Spring 21, and you can get yourself a ticket for £10. Now, if you guys, anyone in the chat, if you're a budding travel writer or a travel photographer, we do have the two incredible competitions that we run as part of National Geographic Traveller. The photography competition is open now, but the travel writing competition will open up in July. So you guys will have the opportunity to have your work published in the pages of National Geographic Traveller. And a couple of you here know how amazing that feels to have, see your name in the mag. And last but not least, um, we have a little subscription offer. If you're not subscribed to National Geographic Traveller magazine, I need you to get it together and do it. We have an, um, a special code at the moment, Book21, where for £30, you get 10 issues of National Geographic Traveller four issues of National Geographic Food and a Bill Bryson book, all for £30. And that's it all from me. Thank you again to everyone who tuned in tonight. And um, take care, stay safe. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next Travel Geeks. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.